here this morning. As you know, we have a guest speaker. Uh, he's not only going to bring our worship service lesson, but he's going to give us a presentation during our uh, morning Bible class. And so I would like to introduce him. Give me a little more time to get it right on the <laughs> main worship service. But uh, this morning we have uh, Brett McCaslin, brother Brett McCaslin. McCaslin was born in Dodge City, Kansas, then raised and graduated from high school in Clovis, New Mexico. He received a Bachelor of Arts degree in Bible from Abilene Christian University in 1984, and a Master of Arts degree in New Testament from Lubbock Christian University in 1993. He worked full time with three churches, serving as the pulpit minister for the Church of Christ in Muleshoe, Texas, <laughs> Roswell, New Mexico, that's where the, and Amarillo, Texas. <laughs> After 12 years of local ministry, he started working with the Keys of the Kingdom, Key to the Kingdom, in 2001, and became the speaker for the television program in 2003. Brett currently lives in Amar Amarillo, Texas. He is married to Becky Lee of Lubbock, Texas. His children's names are Shyla, Shyla, Andrew, Michael, and Taylor, and one granddaughter named Ruslan Rose. And he's no stranger here. He's been here before several times and uh, we're always happy to uh, participate in supporting, you know, the churches of Christ throughout the world. And uh, we just appreciate him willing and wanting to come out and be with us this morning. So, no further ado, Brother Brett McCaslin. I'm going to take this off. Probably be better for me to do that. As I speak, my glasses get fogged up. <laughs> I wonder if I might move up here. Uh, that way I can see. What one is this on? Okay, you can hear. Okay, okay. Let's go with that then. Well, my my wife is here with me. Becky is her name. She found a plum tree out there, so we'll. See if she can get back before worship. I don't know. <laughs> uh, it is a pleasure to be with the Hayward congregation this morning. We're grateful to be here. We came in last night. And we'll be in California and Oregon for about a week and a half. Our, our plan is to visit a number of our supporting congregations and individuals who are scattered in California and Oregon over that time period. We're headed down to Hollister this evening, and then up to Eureka, and then into Oregon uh, later this week. A couple of appointments up there. I've tried to come out every three years to California and to visit all of our supporters, and so it's about three years since I was here last, back in 2019. And so we're grateful to be here today and to give you a report concerning Key to the Kingdom. Well over 20 years, maybe close to 25 years, this congregation has been an active monthly supporter of this mission effort. And for that, we are very, very thankful. We appreciate your faithfulness. We appreciate the gifts you send every single month. And I want you to know that those funds are continually being used to advance the kingdom of God, to share the word with many people. Uh, it's a mass media ministry, and people can access this work through television, through the internet, uh, Facebook, a number of different media resources. And that's what we uh, originally started out as, and it has evolved over time into work in India. Now, I think you're familiar with that. I see that you, you get our quarterly newsletter. You get a monthly thank you letter. So you're up to date. You know about the various things going on from time to time. And my purpose this morning is simply to 
uh, go through some slides, uh, PowerPoint presentation to talk about these things. And if you have questions, please feel free to ask, and I will attempt to give an answer. So, we broadcast on NBC out of Amarillo, Texas, uh, about a 125 mile radius. This is television. We broadcast two times every week, Saturday night, and then also Sunday morning. We have a dedicated channel, as you notice here, on Roku television. So if anybody has Roku, they can set that up and see various lessons that are on there from week to week. That's a picture of our website. It is keytothekingdom.com. Oftentimes, people will add an S to the word key based on Matthew chapter 16, but my thought is you only need one key to get to heaven, so you don't need several keys, just one. So it's key to the kingdom, but you can go there and find a number of different resources that would be of assistance. We have two-minute messages that are broadcast on television, also through the website called Key Moments. These are various things that I do in and around Amarillo, various settings, application of God's Word. You can download onto your phone. If you have a smartphone, just uh, download Key to the Kingdom, and you can have it as a free app. And you can get all of the things that we offer through the website on that app, daily devotional thoughts, and a number of other things. And of course, we have a Facebook page. Every Sunday night, about 6.15 or so California time, we upload either one of those two-minute messages or a one-minute devotional thought. And so I would encourage you to find Key to the Kingdom on Facebook. If you like to do Facebook, to watch those messages, to, to like it, to share it with other people. Right now we are receiving, well, we're probably having uh, 1,200 to 1,500 people every week watching those messages, well, which I think is good. Uh, we're just trying to get the word out in many different formats. As I stated earlier, the work of Key to the Kingdom has somewhat evolved over into India, and I've made about 15 trips over there the last 17 years. My plans are to go back again in August. I've had to take a break from that for the last two years because of COVID. Uh, 2019 was my last trip there, so I look forward to going back and checking on the work. Just to give you some bearings of where we are, here is India, of course, Arabian Sea, the Bay of Bengal, and, and Hyderabad right there in the middle where the pointer is. We have an office there in Hyderabad. It's a city of about 10 million people. And the viewing audience is a potential of some 30 million people that we broadcast into South India. Uh, here's a breakdown of all of the different states, we would call them. Hyderabad here is the capital of the state called uh, Telangana. We broadcast over here in Andhra Pradesh. Uh, you've heard of persecution in India. It's primarily in this state right here, Orissa. We have work going on in Maharashtra, Karnataka, uh, Andhra Pradesh, primarily in that area. This is another map, Hyderabad. We go about 90 miles into Surya Pet. And Surya Pet is a focus of a number of different ministries that we have. We have a school there, we teach, we have a clinic, we have an elderly, we call it, they call it an old age home, somewhat of a retirement home, if you will. And we'll get into some of those stories and pictures in a moment. Just to show you what life is like in India. I don't think you could get by with that in California, could you? I, I know it doesn't work in Texas. Uh, how about riding on top of a bus going down a major highway? Uh, it, it's amazing what you see. And I took that picture or found that picture because I look at this fellow here on the back. He's looking at his cell phone going down the highway. 
riding along, it just, it's amazing. I took a picture of this and I try to visit this place every year. It's just outside of Surya Pit. This is the god Hunnaman. He's called the monkey god. It is the largest freestanding idol in Southeast Asia. And when people are with me, I stop and I say, this is what people worship. It's representative of hundreds of different gods, idols, and images. And we are here in India broadcasting on television to tell them about the one true God and not all of these other gods, idols, and images. And so that gives you an idea of what you have there in India. Here's a few figures that might be of interest. About 1.4 billion people, uh, average of 1,100 people per square mile. In the United States, it's 100 people per square mile. It's just amazing. And you can read some of that for yourself. Two-thirds of the people live in villages. Villages are considered anything that's 50,000 people or less. So you can see the various demographics of India, uh, two-thirds of the people. That is where the majority of our work is. We work out in the villages among those people. Uh, they are able to get television, and so we follow up with the local preachers in those areas. The vision that we have for Key to the Kingdom is to equip, empower, and encourage the Indians to discipleship maturity, ministry, and leadership. In other words, we are trying to come alongside of them and help them in the work they are already doing. We don't want to do the work for them, but we want to help them through the media tools, through the resources, through teaching through materials that we give to help train leaders, elders, uh, Bible school equipment, we purchase Bibles, a number of different things. And our goal is so they can go and make disciples or plant churches in their own people, among their own people. You think about the words of Jesus in that great commission in Matthew chapter 28. And we know about going and making disciples of all nations. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in the uh, sermon time. But we think about making disciples for ourselves. That is the task that they take very seriously also. They make disciples among their own people. We see the word yate here. And I'm going to talk about that again. Yates are people who have a different language and who don't know Jesus, they're within India. And I'll explain all of that here in the next message. I put some material out there on the table. It shows a pyramid. And the pyramid is the basis from which we work with Key to the Kingdom. And it all begins with preaching the word on television. And from that, we have dis making disciples and training leaders. That takes care of at least half of the funds that are sent to India. And the other things are the various ministry helps that we give. And so I want to kind of show how all of that flows together. Feel free to pick up one of those pyramid sheets or another information sheet that is there by it. This is one of the television stations. Uh, we've been on the air for 15 years, 16 years in India. 
I was in a motel room. The program came on. And um, that's just a picture I took sitting on the bed looking at the television screen. We do follow-up to those broadcast. We receive an average of 1,500 requests for Bibles and or Bible studies every month. Prior to COVID, do you remember a time prior to COVID? <laughs> yeah, the good times, right? We were averaging about 700, 800 requests for Bibles or studies. So, what happened? Well, when the COVID hit India, the entire nation was shut down by Prime Minister Modi. Nobody could go anywhere or do anything for about eight weeks. That's the way they dealt with it. What happened was people had to stay home. What did they do while they were home? Watch more television. So they saw our programs more so than what they had in the past. And so they called in, they requested Bibles and studies to the tune of twice as many as what was before COVID. And so right now, that continues on. Some 1,500 requests. And they are filled by Jonathan, who is the man in the red. He is our coordinator of all of the efforts there. And I've been working with him for all of these years. But we have a number of preachers. We have over 50 preachers who are on partial support. And they work among the villages. And this is just representative of some of those preachers. The requests are sent to them out in the villages. They follow up. We distribute Bibles. We distribute those Bible lessons. And that's how the trickle-down effect begins to work. Here's a typical village home in which one of our preachers lives. Jonathan goes out, he works with the preachers, he encourages them, uh, teaches, helps, whatever needs to be done. Another set of preachers that he is working with. We went over to Syria Pet on our map a moment ago. Here are some things that are offered there at the campus. A leadership school, a health clinic, and then the care center. This is the big classroom that we have inside of that building. Uh, again, Jonathan, he's a 38-year-old man. He speaks three languages fluently, and it's a trust relationship that we have. I know his family. He knows mine. Uh, I've stayed in his home. He travels with me, and he is the one who just helps keep everything going. This is an example of some of the preachers, some of the leaders whom we are training on a regular basis. The leadership school is very important because we are teaching and baptizing all of those people out there in the villages. Okay, what happens after someone is baptized into Christ? They need to start learning, do they not? They need to grow up, they need to mature in Jesus. And so we are training spiritual leaders and elders. In fact, we have placed over 100 elders in various congregations that are familiar with Key to the Kingdom. And so that's a very important part of our work. Not only are we teaching and baptizing and making disciples, but we're helping train spiritual leaders to follow through. Meetings like this go on on a regular basis. Uh, here are some of the leaders being trained. These are all of the men. In fact, we have 20 men who go through basically two college semesters of actual training and in-depth Bible study and giving them the tools and some of the basic resources they need to go back to their <clears throat> village churches to carry on the work. And so that is the current group of men who are being trained to be the spiritual leaders in those congregations. We baptize roughly 1,000 people per year through Key to the Kingdom. And that comes as a result of TV broadcasting, Bibles, 
Bible study being sent out, the follow-up of the local preachers, it all works together. Uh, I have never baptized anybody in India. People have asked me that question, and two reasons. Number one, it's against the law. I would be accused of proselyting. As an American, I can't do that in India. And number two, the water's bad. I don't want to get in the water. Uh, it's obviously undrinkable, and it's certainly not safe for me to be in. Pictures of our people baptizing in the rivers uh, in a baptistry that's located outside of a prayer hall, is what they call them, or a church building. So these are regular occurrences. Here is a congregation of people. Usually the churches are about 50 in average size. They don't get too big because it will draw too much attention to themselves and run the risk of persecution of some sort. And when they get that big, they begin to split off and start another congregation in another preacher's home nearby or another elder's home nearby. Typical congregations, typical the, the man there in the middle, he is the preacher. Uh, here is a congregation that just opened up, uh, a church that was planted, we would call it. Uh, this was opened up just within the last month. These are fresh pictures. And that's exciting. We have over 300 congregations scattered throughout South India that know about or a result of the work that's being done by Key to the Kingdom and all of the indigenous preachers in India. So again, this is a typical occurrence. I love the next two pictures. The children, they're having a vacation Bible school, as we would call it, right there in the villages. And that little baby, precious little child, in the middle of the circle, learning to pray. And that's so important. Another congregation of people. There at the Surya Pet campus, you saw the building where we do our primary teaching and educating. About a hundred yards back to the north, we have the clinic and also the care center. The clinic, we will see 700 patients per month. Uh, it's run by two pharmacists. You see in the picture there, Ganesh and Jay Raj. And they give out basic medicinal products to people, uh, cold and cough, antibiotic, uh, pain medicines, that kind of thing. Even though I estimate half of the nation of India is diabetic, we do not give out any diabetic medicine because if we did that, there would be no other funds left to do anything else. So we focus on just the basic needs of people and then we have a doctor who visits from time to time and he will take some of the more sick people into the town and give them a discount for any kind of other medical services. This is inside the clinic. People come and it's open about six days a week and it's a very effective ministry. Right next to the, care, or the clinic is the Hope Care Center. And you notice I use the word hope quite often. I call this the hope campus. We are offering spiritual and physical hope to the people of India. And we do that through all of these different ministries. As you visualize this pyramid I'm talking about, preaching the word, making disciples, training leaders, and now we help those who are sick. We, we give a place to live for those who are elderly. This care center was opened up five years back. 30 elderly Christians who have no home live here. These are examples of, of some of the people. They have all of their belongings with them. What you see they're wearing and what they have on the shelves is all they have to their name. For the most part, they have been rejected by their families. Their families have taken over their home and their home place and they don't have any place to live. And so we bring them here, 
and they are able to receive good fellowship with other Christians. They receive meals every day. They're right next to the clinic to take care of their medicinal needs, and it's really serving a good purpose. They also receive two sets of clothes every year. You met Jonathan a moment ago. His wife, let me see where she is. She is the tall lady standing here. Her name is Deepaw. She coordinates a benevolent effort. We don't support this. Their church supports this. They come up with the funds to provide the clothing for the elderly people, the 30 who live there, two times every year. And so it's not all of what we do, but they are empowered and equipped to use their own resources to help people. Uh, that was a picture of the 20 women, and this is a picture of the 10 or so men. There are some others, uh, Jonathan, of course, and then we've got some of our leaders and teachers here at the back. But these men here in the front, those are the men who live here at the care center. The people live on this side, over here. This is a big hall, if you will. Uh, the whole facility is 7,100 square feet. This is an area where we have big fellowship meetings, uh, seminars. When I am there, everybody will come and we will we'll teach and worship together. As is typical in India, the culture is Women sit on one side and men sit on the other. That's just the way it is. We feed people. The Hope Feeding Center. When COVID started a couple of years back, many people lost their jobs. They had no way to, to make a living. They had no way to feed their family. Most people in India live from one day to the next. They try to survive on about $2 per day. So when all of that happened, the decision was made by Jonathan, it's not always my decisions, that we need to feed some people. And so right now, this is one of our fellowship meals that we took. I took this picture when I was there. But right now, we are feeding people, as you can see, from 1 to 7 p.m. every day. We give out 50 meals daily and or distribute food and take it out to people who cannot get to the Hope Campus. So we are providing food for 50 different people every single day. And here, even in the driving rain, you can see one of our pharmacists, he's just soaking wet. We continue to feed these people who are in need. How can people learn about Jesus? How can they have an appetite to pursue God if their stomachs are empty? And so this is a very important thing that we are continuing on even today. People oftentimes ask, well, what do you feed? We feed them very basic food. White rice and a gravy that's called dal, D-A-H-L, maybe some vegetables. And that's about all it is, but it is enough to sustain them. And here are some of the bags of groceries that we take out to people who cannot get to the Hope Campus. One of the things that we do, and you'll see this on the pyramid, we offer helps to the people. The men receive bicycles, which cost $75 a piece, and they use them as their primary source of transportation. Most all preachers have two or three congregations they see about every week. So they need some way to get four or five miles from one place to the other. And we distribute 30 of those every year. Right now we have distributed 440 450 bicycles over the years. This past year, since I had not been there for a couple of years, 
Jonathan finally said, you know, brother, we need to distribute bikes and sewing machines. Well, how do you want to do that? Well, we need you to do it. We'll just do it right here in, in the hall, in the care center. And so we had 30 men identified by Jonathan who need a bicycle and 30 women who need a sewing machine. And they came together for the big distribution. And when I'm there, that's always a big deal at the Hope Campus, to give them those helps. And we have distributed right at 440 sewing machines to women. They are the treadle sewing machines. Anybody remember a treadle sewing machine? The electricity in India is very sporadic, unreliable. And so those type of sewing machines are, <clears throat> are what is used. So we had 30 men, 30 women show up for the distribution. And Jonathan told me, he said, Brett, I want you to be a part of that. Well, how? He said, let's have a Zoom conference. Anybody heard of Zoom? Yes. Three years ago, did you know what Zoom was? Yes. <laughs> Some of you did, maybe. If you bought stock in it, that was pretty good back in the day. Well, currently, I have a Zoom conference with Jonathan at least once a month, 45 minutes. And we would talk about things. We work together. We study together. And he said, let's just have a Zoom conference. He said, let's have it at 2.30 in the afternoon on this day. I said, great. He said, brother, for you, that's 5 o'clock in the morning. I thought, well, I guess I can get up for that. So I got up early in the morning, and I got prepared for my Zoom, and, and was ready to talk to all of the people, and he texted me, and he said, oh, we're not ready, it's going to be another 30 minutes. I thought, I could still be in bed, Jonathan. But finally we got it going, and it was so exciting to be a part of that distribution. Can, can you see, I'm here in my office, in my home, and this is Jonathan, this is his father. Uh, it was really a neat thing. And to see the expressions on the Indians' faces, 10,000 miles away. They had never seen anything like this before. And that was really a, a wonderful experience. And so the women, the men, they take these gifts and they move on and put them to use in their ministries. As I mentioned a moment ago, we, our goal is to equip them to carry on their work. And we are getting to the point where they are becoming self-supporting. It's taking time and it will take more time. But they come up with ideas on how they can support their own work. For example, here at the campus, we have this plot of ground in which they are growing marigolds. It is a really big deal in India to have garlands around your neck and to honor people for special occasions. They put that garland of marigolds or, or corneliuses or a very sweet smelling flower. They make those garlands. And so one of the projects is they are growing marigolds and they have two crops per year. And they sell them in town for those garlands and they're looking at other things which they can do to help sustain and provide for their work, which is great. Uh, mission works are not to be designed to be a perpetual support from Americans. I have told them over and over again, eventually the support in America will run out. What are you going to do? You have to train and disciple your people to support your preachers to carry on your work at the churches in your areas. And I think he's getting tired of me saying that. But yet at the same time, that is important when it comes to really doing mission work effectively. When I think about our overall mission effort, this is a summary passage that I, it means a great deal to me because this is the model I've tried to use as the pattern for what we're doing. The familiar passage from Matthew chapter 9, talking about the ministry of Jesus. 
He went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues. That's what we're doing. We're going everywhere in towns and villages through the internet, through television, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. <coughs> Not that we're healing people, but we're providing a clinic to help heal their sickness and diseases. <coughs> and when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to the disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray for the Lord of harvest to send forth workers into his harvest field. Think back about those pictures I showed of the people riding on top of the bus and traveling down the highway. The crowds of people in India are everywhere. 1.4 billion people. Four times the number of people living in America in one third of the space. It's hard to fathom. Especially for us living out in West Texas. It might be more so living in a metropolitan area like San Francisco. The people are everywhere. And they need both the physical and the spiritual helps that we can give them. Just like Jesus gave to the people when he was here on the earth. Here are some results from last year's work broadcasting twice a week responses to the television broadcast leadership seminars right on down the line helping build prayer halls we trained 100 leaders we distributed 6,000 Bibles that's 500 Bibles per month 18,000 Bible lessons and baptized 625 people last year down from the thousand per year but because of the restrictions of COVID it was hard for our preachers to go out and travel and do some of the follow up so the last two years have been down but overall it's roughly a thousand people per year being baptized uh, the preachers non-supported preachers a thousand different people are working for the Lord that we know about who are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they're not getting paid by us to do that. Uh, all the different things, 9,000 total meals served to hungry people last year. As we move ahead, we're going to make more disciples, develop more leaders, and trust more responsibility. We want to make this a sustainable mission effort. Let me pause now. We have just a few minutes, maybe. Questions or comments from anybody about our work? I was just curious. I know the men come to the church. Do the women have to follow, or is it their choice to join the Lord's church? Uh, another man came and what? No, I, know the women come. I know the men, when they join the church, do the women have to follow them, or do, is it their, the women's choice to follow them when they join the church? It is a male-dominated society, 
Um, is there ever an opportunity for all the congregations that you, you, you start there to meet together as a group and worship together as a group? Or? Yes. When I'm there, they bring many people from all different congregations. When I'm not there, they still have some of those fellowship meals together. Fellowship meetings, fellowship Bible studies. Uh, they try to do that on a monthly basis there at the whole campus in the big hall there at the church. You know. And Jonathan is in charge of all that. He, he knows the work. And we have a good relationship. He'll make those decisions, and I, I support whatever he does. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. It showed you teaching the Bible, but do you also teach just the basic reading and writing to the younger kids and stuff, or do they already know that when they get there? Uh, they teach some of the basic things, too. Basic reading and writing. In India, they know that in order to get out of a poverty situation, they need to know English. And so many of them are being trained in English. And they are educated. Uh, we have some scholarship fund money that are given to some people who are showing good potential to get out of that situation. So we're mindful of that, and we help with some of the training in the English area too. Yes. What does your wife do over there? She just lounges, lays around in the bed and motel room. <laughs> <laughs> I have taken her with me two times. Uh, the last time was 2019. And she will travel with me wherever I go. Oftentimes we will have ladies' classes. And she will teach them, I will teach the men. Uh, in the past, she has taught in school, a regular public school, probably 100 children with watchful eyes everywhere all around that big classroom, and she talked a creation story to those children. She is a big asset in India. She helps me, she supports, uh, she works with the women and teaches several different, I don't have those slides, but uh, she will have ladies' days, if you will. And I remember when she had one there at the whole campus, there were probably 25 or 30 women who were there she spoke and she taught, and Jonathan's wife translated for her. So while I'm working with the men, she's working with the women, with the children. And it's a, it's a good partnership for sure. Now you said that they had to keep their groups small to keep from being persecuted. How badly are Christians persecuted in India? I mean, it's a large country. It's been, you know, modernized. A lot of people go through. So how, how much Christianity is in there and how much do they hold on to their own beliefs? The question is about persecution. Uh, there are pockets of persecution in various states, like Orissa, that I showed. Um, we probably don't know the full scope of persecution. Uh, there are some who are persecuted I just don't know for sure. I know that one of our preachers has been persecuted in the past. Uh, he was beaten up by five men, left for dead. He recovered. And I said, we need to move him from that area. And Jonathan said, oh, brother, that's his home place. He has already gone back there. And he continues to preach the gospel. And four of those men came and said, forgive us, we're sorry. He talked to them about Jesus and baptized them in Christ. Sometimes through persecution, good things can happen. Right. You think about the spread of the church. Think about Saul. Remember him persecuting the church? What happened? The people scattered. And they took the gospel other places. Uh, Prime Minister Modi is a hardline Hindu. And there's a segment of the government which is called Hindu Hunter. And they are his henchmen, I call them. And they are out to persecute Christians. And that is more of a threat than Islam right now in India. The hardline, right wing, radical wing of Hindus. And that's what I have to be aware of. I think 
think our time is gone. We need to take about a 15 minute break. Let me say thank you for being here this morning. Thank you again for your financial contribution. Thank you for your prayers. And I look forward to continuing to be with you today. Let's end with the word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we give you thanks for another day of life. We're grateful for your loving kindness toward us. We're thankful for the opportunity to come together to meet, to worship you, to fellowship with one another, and to think about what you are doing in your mission field throughout this world. I thank you so very much for this group of people who continue to support, encourage, and pray for this work. Thank you for the partnership we share together in your mission field. In Jesus' name, amen.